This conference will now be recorded. Noise. Well, it can't be Loretta. It started before Loretta got on. I think it's Pam. Pam, do you have something running in the background? I've got my phone right next to me so I can look at the agenda, but my dogs aren't snoring or anything. They're quiet. Well, and, okay. I mean, my refrigerator is running. No. No, you, so you don't have this on two devices. No one has it on two devices? No. No, just okay. one. It's weird. All right, whatever. Okay, I don't know if anyone looked at the minutes of 517. Um, yeah, it looks good. And so I, I move we accept them. Okay. Do we want to agree? For a second. Yep. Okay, so um, I just wanted to let you know that um, we, we finally, I think, got this whole thing worked out with the Ashford Oak and fencing. And um, we did go to Mansfield Supply, which ended up being quite expensive. I think, I don't know the exact figure. Yes, I do have it. Hang on just a second. Maybe it's me. When I moved, it seemed to make a lot of no, noise. No, it, it happened before you got on. Oh. Um, the, the lumber for the fencing was $510.40. So our amount was $250. <laughs> so um, Steve and Rob, Rob being the AT representative who deals with just uh, Ashford Trust, who, who manages Ashford Oak, will put that together. I think sometimes this summer because they have the the um, lumber in storage. So that'll make you happy, Christine. Uh, yes, it will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your goal is to keep me happy, Loretta. <laughs> I guess so. I don't know. That's a pretty. That's a pretty steep. Uh, it is. Oh. And um, I did. Janet had sent me a picture of uh, Stephanie and Bill and Pam and Steve working on the trail. So I put that in the Citizen and said that the trail is now complete and you guys cleaned it up. So um, hopefully at some point we'll put up a map and a. Um, get that all straightened out so it'll be done. Um, cool, hooray for you guys. Yeah. So, um, was it hot that day that you guys worked? It was, it was it warm, was, but it I was wouldn't warm, say hot. But not, not uncomfortable. Uh huh. And was there a lot of stuff down on the trail? Was there a lot of didn't seem like it. More of the markings were difficult to follow in some places. That was mm -hmm. the, the trail. We was, cut, cut. We cut some branches to make some of the um, markings easier to see. The blaze is easier to see. Mm -hmm. but, get lost. Where you turn from Rankin back onto the link, that was a little problematic. Do you know where I mean? I didn't hear what you said. Oh, the place where when you're when you get you walk up the hill, you jump onto Rankin, and then you switch back onto the link. And that was, there were yeah. some problems with that in terms of finding that or seeing that. Did did you sort of look at that and, and uh, make sure it was easily identifiable? Do you remember that that part? 
There were a few spots that were hard to see. Remember, Janet? We talked, there was one spot we talked about putting in another arrow. And we talked about a couple places moving the, moving the markers uh -huh. to different trees. Um, so it looks like that's pretty set for now. Um, and sometimes people create another map like he did. I think that was that. He did at Langhead. So that you can see that and see the connection between Rankin. This might be the application. Really crappy. A lot of noise coming from somewhere. Hey, if I think it's you, try putting your putting yourself on mute. Yeah, I'm muting it because it keeps saying that I am talking and there is no noise in here. I'm putting myself on mute. Okay. okay. There's someone in the from, there that might be from your phone. If you maybe move your phone, it wouldn't be the problem. I don't know. I'm gonna turn it off uh, since, uh, let's see if it makes a difference. Okay, hopefully that'll do it. Um, the next thing I had on, under old business was um, the program that we, that Christine actually did uh, on Saturday, the Pollinators um, Pathway Program. And maybe you could talk a little bit what you what you thought, Christine, and some of the others might, might wanna say what they, experience i had fun it was great and i was i was so pleased that we had 10 people including me which was really nice yeah, muting. yeah so we had 10 people including me um we did a little walk around we couldn't walk through the field because <laughs> the people who came to mow it didn't come till today um but i think we saw some cool things we had some great discussion um everybody shared what they were doing which um you know everybody has their own little pieces of pollinator gardens so hopefully um they'll all get put on the pollinator pathway and we'll have a good showing in ashford because right now it's only me i sent around a bunch of stuff today some of the resources that i had found um, so people certainly now have enough um, information to really kind of go ahead with in increasing their pollinator gardens. I think the thing that was most interesting to me is that people had an idea that it had to be a big area that right. you had to have <clears throat> a amount of acreage in order to register this and do this. And, and it seemed like a couple of the people who were there were were very interested in registering they just didn't think they had a big enough piece of property to do that and so christine you were really good about explaining you know that it only needs a little tiny bit in in a order a couple to... containers right. <laughs> and i think i think we should get marion to put the um the pollinators little garden there in front of the library on yeah, I'll talk. I'll talk to her. She's in my writing group, so I'll talk to her next time I see her. Yeah, they're meeting right now, so I'm missing it. Because that's already done, so it right. should be relatively. <laughs> but yes. everybody who was there has something that's already done that they could put in. So mm -hmm. you know, it was interesting. That you didn't have to have Acres. an established. Yeah. Um, pollinator area because we just started ours and for instance we planted milkweed but it's not gonna be another um, year before bear really for, blossoms, you yeah. know uh, another year but we have stuff it's just in the beginning stages which you is have, apparently okay yeah, yeah when you listed what you have you have plenty yeah and and beginning to do this it's really the intention that people what, what the originators from what i understand of this whole program was to get people to do things differently so it's just not 
lawns everywhere with, with chemicals. I mean, I think the biggest thing was chemicals. It wasn't so much the lawn, it was really the chemicals. So they were trying to eradicate pe pesticide use and also get people thinking in terms of native plants, even if it means when you go to the nursery just to ask what are native plants or not. Because I know a lot of people who purchase non-native and, and invasive plants that they were totally unaware of what they were doing. So I think part of this is a huge educational process and other towns are, are really doing it. Willimantic did a couple of things. I know Chaplin and Mansfield um, did a couple of things. So, and Joshua's Trust is very interested um, in doing it. So if anybody needs any of these little buttons, just let me know, because we have several to put up. Um, and I think that's great that that there was a, a lot of interest. Plus, there was a, a woman who came who is very interested in the, in the pollinators thing and everything, but she's interested in getting involved in, in town activities. So hopefully through this, we might get a new recruit. So that's even, even more encouraging. And we had one person from out of town, Charlotte Pyle, who is kind of an expert on plants in, in many ways. Um, she was able to offer her expertise too and everything. So I think it was a really good gathering and thanks Christine for putting it all together and providing all that information, which is really good. The thing that I thought was the best is everybody sharing in the circle of things that they did and, and things that have worked for them. Um, Bill was talking about um, getting things to grow more rapidly which yes, is peroxide. <laughs> I, I was so glad when you said the percentage, you also said the amounts because the percentage was like, well, how do I know what is three percent? Really I can I can I can send I can send around the information on that. Some of the oh, that would be cool. Yeah. That would be cool. <laughs> it's just like, yes, I'm I'm striking. Some of those things that scientists know, although there were, yes, there were a lot of scientists there, so I guess a lot of people didn't, didn't bat an eye over that. Um, okay, so going along to the new business, we had a, a very brief, best kind of meetings I know of, um, meeting this morning with the fellow for Sustainable Connecticut. He's only there for the summer. I thought he was there summer into the yeah. spring, but apparently he's only there for the summer. And he, he kind of gave us a very brief rundown of what we, we really don't need to do much. And I say that in quotes, because we do have to do an equity thing, which I think is more than much. But anyway, um, other than that, there's just a couple of things that we would need to do and one of them we could already be included in because they're starting a whole multi-town project for homelessness in um pomford or putnam um i think um, it's i think it's pomford yeah pomford so that if we like were part, yeah if we were part of that that probably could be used for that i think it's number 12. That, that's the new one that's added because they felt um, the problem of homelessness was, was right there. And Christine asked the question if there was any homelessness in Ashford. And by that, I mean, I don't, I don't think um, Catherine was, was there. Um, and I, know, Christine, I don't think she was really listening. She just had her icon there. <laughs> yeah. um, so that the, it might even be any work that we did to try and figure that out, such as contacting is social service, talking with the uh, um, senior housing person and talking uh, with uh, um, Kit at, at the senior center might give us, in, and um, the pastor at the food bank. All of them might right. give us a clearer understanding of what that situation is. Um, because I certainly don't know and, I, you know, I mean, I think, it was a surprise to me that, oh yeah, well there could be people who are homeless. You know, I'll bet there are college students that are couch surfing. Uh huh. Could could that be um, turned into our equity piece? Right. 
we did some kind of surveys or something on that. Oh, except that we need to we need to use it for that one um, piece. So what do you mean? It could, I don't think it could do double duty. Well, well they, uh, um, it it could be in that we could get the equity piece with the survey, and we could get the. I think I haven't looked specifically at the um, descriptions of it. But the homelessness one could be with the group that's working with homelessness that tried city or however many towns. It seemed like that's what uh, Brandon seemed to in, in, it seemed to indicate yeah. that that could happen. So it may be that we could do both, and if we were going to do something like that, we could check um, either with him or with one of the regular sustainable Connecticut people because they're always they're pretty available to us most of the time and if we needed help I think they would assign a regular person um to work with us they, I was surprised I they I thought they had fellows before all during the whole year but apparently they don't so but the recertification is relatively simple because most of what we have done still is active the problem is it sounded like what he said he didn't get into the specifics but i was thinking about this afterwards you do have to recertify for all these credits and there may be a little clause in there that says what have you done since or what are your goals for the future so um that might be something that we'll have to check out but it still didn't it didn't sound like it was anywhere near the grueling trek that we did last time so it seemed right. like that would be a good thing to do and would get us um a couple more years to see if we wanted to go for the other I, i'm certainly not interested in going for for the um the silver so, and having to deal with three equity no I, you know you've got to be really ambitious and you've got to have a lot of town workers who are you know doing a lot of the grunt work oh, i staff. yeah yeah so um but that was encouraging to know that and we have until um december of 22. Uh, it, it seems like the good idea would be to aim for may of next year submit and then if there's any problems we have a couple of months to move things around and get it right and during that may to august we would have a fellow helping us because they have that they have the summer interns i guess we call them fellows well there may be some some things we could just plug away at like um the, the things that we just have to uh, document are still ongoing you know uh -huh. maybe we could submit those this august and get that that settled you know, I mean, we could just we could do this as a running project instead of all of a sudden kick in and bust our asses. <laughs> oh, I see. So we would do some of it now. I don't. Yeah, that's a possibility. We can check with Brandon to see if that is something that could be done. The other good thing is that Melissa joined Melinda joined us. And so we have another person who hasn't been through this. So that's just an extra worker that we have which can be really helpful i think and it's exciting that there's new people coming in i mean it sort of like gets a little old after a while with the same people just plugging away i mean i found that sustainable is is a lot of work so <laughs> i don't know how everybody else felt but it was a lot to do um and also when i sent out the listing to people um deb gag said that she would help doing anything in regards to uh arts right and i think the fact we do already have a poet laureate right we could maybe use yeah. that yeah we've got that and she and there are a bunch of um events that are happening so the arts is going to be easy and again yeah. you know i'm thinking that could be submitted this august as you know the ongoing stuff so that mm -hmm. at least that would be done and done and done mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there might be other ones that are in that same category that would be just really easy to just get done and done, and then it wouldn't look so daunting. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the thing that, yeah, it, it would be good to be thinking about 
what we could use as the equity piece because that is the thing it's just a step-by-step -step process and we've got to hook in all along the way the other things it's it's not such a challenge so you know to be thinking about and maybe what Janet suggested is a survey of sorts might be a thing to do or there might be some other thing to do because what, I think, what was I think yeah. Susan Eastwood said that she, they would be interested in I, I think there was another project that we talked about and and maybe we could hook into that um, mm -hmm. but you know the equity piece is really not as daunting as you think right <laughs> Right. You, have to, you just have to start from the beginning and you have to do a needs assessment. You can't just decide Go that you it. want to do something because you want to do it. Right. Uh, you, you have the whole point is you have to get buy in from the community or at least the group that you're trying to serve. Right. It, you have to plan it and uh, at, from the beginning, you can't get in halfway. And say you have to decide what metrics you're going to use to evaluate it before you do it mm -hmm. not afterward not say oh well this worked because 10 yeah. people showed up so so what is susan's project i don't remember i have to they're drifting out i'd have to talk with her i don't remember okay Okay, we can we can check with her to to find out. Um, but I I I was surprised that it didn't look like it was going to be as difficult as initially I had right. thought. So I think that that seems like the way to go. Um, the other thing I just wanted to tell people about was these um, adelgid, these uh, little bugs that hang out on the hemlocks and. Yeah. Brian Barkley um, emailed me oh, sometime in May and said that he had seen the eggs of these things on his hemlocks. He lives on Cushman and um, there's, I think, three big apartment buildings there. And it's kind of like a pretty nice um, grove of hemlocks around that, right running next to Knowlton Brook. And um, his kid had brought him a, some hemlock needles and he turned it over. Well, there they were. And apparently there's this whole program um, that is run <clears throat> by the department. It's the Connecticut Agricultural Station where they get these uh, predator beetles and they're actually grown commercially. They um, bring them to the site and then they release these little beetles right on the eggs. And the beetles are like, maybe like a pencil point, if that large, they're very tiny. I said to Carol, I said, well, how big are these beetles gonna get? And she started laughing and she said, no, these are as big as they get. I said, these beetles are gonna kill all these, you know, eggs. And she said, yeah, they eat voraciously. They only eat these eggs of this adelgids. And if there's another species on the hemlock, they will eat that, but they won't eat anything else. And they just die off if the, if the adelgid dies off, then they do too. Um, they will fly from hemlock to hemlock, but they don't go to other trees. And she's been working on this program since 1999. And she said she recently visited a couple of sites that they re, um, released the first group of these um, predator beetles. And those trees are still vibrant. And that so that's over 20 years. So wow. that saying something um, because it's usually pretty deadly once the hemlock gets attacked by these little beetles. Um, and with the beetles usually are, um, this is called scale. A fungus or something. Pardon? Isn't it a fungus or something? Yeah, it's sort of like that. It sort of makes them look blondish, um, the needles. So oftentimes they go hand in hand, but I think that's because they go to the the trees that are not as healthy. Um, and one of the things that this Carol Ch Chi, I C H E A H, I think is her last name, said was that um, because we've had two mild winters, the adelgia usually dies during the winter, but 
they didn't die this winter because of the warmth. So um, that's why there's been a lot of um, places in Connecticut, particularly Eastern Connecticut, that have seen an outbreak of this. There was an outbreak several years ago um, and then that abated and maybe that was because there was a couple of really cold years. Um, but the, the, the two years plus the drought, plus apparently the winds um, affect that these bugs can get carried on the winds from other, other places. So I was just really intrigued by all this and amazed that, that this is really happening and it apparently has been very successful. Oftentimes up to 70% of these bugs will be eaten by these little you can barely see them. I was like, what? You know, and they have them in these little containers, almost like um, uh, little Files. worms that you get when you go fishing. You know, there's little circular things. They're not very big. So they have a hundred in each of those. They are very expensive though. They are 250 above. 250? So for a hundred, a hundred bucks, it's $250. Yeah. So well, you I have no you know where all those those all those hemlocks in the Yale Forest, miles and miles and miles of them. That's all. The Yale Forest is all hemlock. <laughs> yeah. Well, I sent the, I sent emails out to everybody I could think of, including Last Green Valley and um, Mark Ashton and Rosa Goldman at Yale Forest. So I spread the word as much as I could. I mean, I would think there are probably other um, people who have hemlocks in Ashford who are infected with this. Um, yeah. But it's, you know, it's some, and the best time to do this is in the spring because then there's still the eggs and apparently I guess it's easier to eradicate right. them at that time. But I, as I said, I was just surprised by all the research that's been done on this. And, you know, I always get a little nervous when we start talking about introducing species and all that, you know, because we've had such horrible results of all that. But this doesn't seem to be the case. This, but the, uh, they call it HWA, hemlock woolly agelid, um, that it came from Japan and this little beetle is from Japan. So that's what's going on with that. And hopefully, um, I put something in the citizen that people will read it and look on their trees and see how they're doing. Um, I think we have strands of hemlock here, you know, as you said at, at Yale Forest, but I think other places also. Oh, there have to be. Yeah. It's always something that's coming along to get that. But I, that was really good that he saw that and was able to catch it. And um, his landlord helped pay for all that, which wow. I thought really very nice and that that to me was kind of unusual that that would happen so well, you know i haven't seen a single gypsy moth caterpillar and uh we can thank that fungus thing for that i think so the, the coolness and the rain uh -huh. really. yeah right. yeah but i haven't seen a single one which is amazing yeah, after what happened before. Yeah. <clears throat> well, of course, there's, you know, a lot of oak trees were taken down. By oh, trees. yeah. Yeah, drive around in these old, beautiful oak skeletons. I know. Everywhere. So that is about, I think, all I had for tonight. Um, does anybody else have anything that, that they have to add or questions that they have or something that I just looking at I ran into a couple news items so I um get a, a feed for the Portland Press Herald in Maine so Maine's ban on plastic bags was uh delayed because of the pandemic and it is now going in effect July 1st uh -huh. so Maine, Maine's ban on plastic bags is happening Second of all, Maine has a bill in their legislature um, aiming to shift the costs of packaging to producers, which I think is wicked cool. <laughs> and cost, I haven't been able to, the, the cost, cost of dealing with, 
of recite or just posting yeah. it. Yep, which I think is fantastic. Maybe that would cut down on some of the stuff that they put around stuff. <laughs> that so was the I, article that I sent you, Pam, about what was happening. I'll, I'll unmute myself. That that article was terrific. It really it it gave me hope and. Um, I just recently saw online that this is just one company, but uh, Dove shampoos and conditioners are now being packaged in uh, their plastic bottles, but they're a hundred percent recycled material that made the new containers. So that's at least one company that's trying to do something. And um, I found another, I was telling, oh, Christine, I think when we were at the farmer's market one day, I found this great company called uh, Responsible Products that they make um, disposable plates, trash bags, um, dog poop bags, uh, food bags, all out of uh, sugar fiber. Mm -hmm. And everything is compostable. They're uh, they don't use plastic eating utensils. You buy bamboo ones that can be washed and reused until they fall apart. And um, I've ordered a lot of stuff from them recently, just trying to get rid of uh, more plastic in my house, you know? Oh, and another thing I found, people that use bleach, they now make, uh, pellets bleach pellets that come in like a tiny little container so you don't have the huge plastic you know bleach bottles to dispose of um i don't know i i get excited about this stuff you know i don't understand really the need for bleach it's really awful stuff it's not good for humans it's not good for anything but, but people buy it and they're going to continue know. to buy it. And if they're given an alternative where, you know, the the amount of plastic in the packaging is, you know, a fraction of what it is normally, it's it's at least a step in the right direction. Yeah, I guess. There's another company I just got some stuff from. It's called Tea Pigs. And they all their all their packaging is um uh compostable. So they have um, paper little um, boxes that they package the tea bags in. The little tea bags themselves, it's a, a mesh made of, I think, corn something. Um, then the tea is obviously compostable. The labels for the tea are paper. So everything is compostable. It's really cool. And the tea is really good, too. Oh. It's a, a British, uh, an English company, but they have... Um, um places in the in the states so if you order stuff it comes from i think pennsylvania and what was the name of the company t t e a pigs p i g s it's a weird name but they have all kinds of really really interesting and good tea i had had some at a friends of what was it mint licorice mint it was really good <laughs> they have all kinds it's a cool company well, those kinds of things are really encouraging to see some of the things that are going on in terms of trying to deal with this astronomical amount of trash that we keep generating day after day, you know, so hopefully um, people can start using these alternatives. If, if you have alternatives available, people are going to use them, I think. It just takes a while to change people's yeah. thinking around. And I think this whole thing with the pandemic and everything really hurt a lot because a lot of people during the pandemic got takeout and a lot of takeout containers are styrofoam so yeah. that or was... plastic or the plastic you know the the black plastic willy waste doesn't take black plastic anymore so all the containers that our farmers market people use are black plastic on the bottom that's all just goes into the garbage I actually tried to tell the people that, but I don't think they appreciated it. <laughs> which, which the people that are selling the food, the yeah. pre prepared food. Yeah, their food is so good, but I can't buy it. I had 
you know, one day I went to go to the, the transfer station and I had 10 containers of black plastic that I had to throw in the trash because it willy waste won't take it. And I, 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 that just makes no sense to me. And I love their food and I told them that. So, <laughs> you know, there are paper containers that people use. You know, it doesn't have to be plastic and it, and it certainly doesn't have to be black plastic. It could be at least white, which can be recycled. But, you know, there's no knowledge of that stuff. Well, that was the genius of the plastic industry to put the recycle symbol on everything. Right. So people think that every plastic item is recycled. Right. And the black one has the recycle symbol on it. But if you go to the Willy Way site, they stop taking the black plastic. So, you know, it's weird. Well, that's the thing. I mean, even recycled plastic may not be used very much because nobody's using it to to do things with. Right. You know, that's right. I I I remember um, I bought a toy for my nephew that was made out of um, recycled uh, milk bottles. So, I mean, I think there there are things that you can do with anything. It's just, are there people who want to create a company to use this stuff? And I think that's that's where the thrust could really make a change right now. Because I think people would buy things if they know that it's made from a recycled product and it's not adding more stuff into our environment. Or it's like what you were saying, Pam, it's, you know, something that you can compost and all that. So, you well, know, think Whole Foods has been using paper containers for their takeout for years now. You know, it's not a new idea, but, you know, whatever. Which state was it in the article that you sent out, Loretta, that uh, was saying they were going to ban all styrofoam containers and things like that? Was that Vermont? I think it might have been Vermont. Yeah, I mean, you know, if they can do it, why can't we follow suit? Well, I just, I don't banning, get it. Connecticut's banning styrofoam for food containers. I think it's in 23 it starts. Okay. What about like when you go to the grocery store and you buy meat? It's sitting on a styrofoam uh, plate, like whatever it is. Will that also be banned? Like all styrofoam? I think it's just takeout food. Hmm. But it's I mean, look at everything that's in, in the big Y. Um, the food coolers, coolers so the meat good. coolers. There are hundreds of them in there. Just and then it's there. wrapped with saran wrap that is also not recyclable. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, Put your paper really works well for wrapping meats and. Uh, I know. Oh, I know. But I'm not sure if butcher paper is really recyclable. It has like a plastic film on the inside, doesn't it? Plastic, plastic or, or wax. wax. I don't know. I don't know. I, I wonder about that. Butcher paper has been around for a long, long, long time. Well, yeah, before before before. <laughs> plastic. But, but can Willy Waste recycle it is the question. Because if they can't, then it's all moot. Mm -hmm. I was surprised. Oh, I'm we, we really about to get people to want to use recycled products or to recycle products to create another product. Because the reason why Willie Waste doesn't take all these things is because they stopped having markets. Right. So that's the whole thing. That's the issue. It's like, how do we encourage people to come up with creative ideas to use our trash? I mean, that's the bottom line. Well, I think, I think the ultimate answer is the cradle to grave um, legislation, where if you produce it, you're responsible for it for with. the lifespan. So yeah. the companies who are producing this stuff have to figure out how to recycle it. And that, yep. would, that would quickly solve that issue. Yep. yep. Things would get more well, expensive, it, but. Um, 
we wouldn't have to clean up that you'd say that you have to you have to spend money buying stuff but you'd spend less on the cleanup and the waste and all that and it's not at all clear to me why it's more expensive you know if they don't have to make the plastic that goes around every single battery that you buy why isn't that a cost saver <laughs> You know, if you don't have to make the plastic coating for every single tiny little thing that's on the shelves and hanging on the little clips all over the place, why isn't that a cost saver? Well, because plastic is really cheap and you have to replace it with something. And they'd have to retool all of their factories for whatever the new product is that they're going to replace it with and they're gonna pass that cost on to the consumers. I mean, anything they can pass on to us, they're going to. They're gonna make us pay through the nose. Well, the thing is that they're not looking at bulk sales because why couldn't you ship batteries, for example, in bulk? And, you know, in the old grocery stores that I went to as a kid, there were bins of things. And things are, I mean, if you want six batteries, pull out six batteries and there they are because they're in a bin or a barrel or a whatever. Um, They've got those yeah. stores in Europe that, you know, have like no packaging. Um, but we're not about to do it. I mean, well, the co op has a lot of, yeah, uh, the co op does that. More so now as COVID has opened, you know, because things have opened up a little bit, but there, there's a lot of things that you can buy and they would like to have more things, but it's hard to get things in bulk now. A lot of the things that they get that are in bulk are from um, cooperative indu industri industries, you know, but if you go into other than that, a lot of times you can't get in bulk. Because or you I get them in bulk and they're still individually packaged. <laughs> anyway, so this is the ongoing dilemma that we have with our trash, our yeah. um, continuing ability to generate more and more trash. I mean, it is really scary. If you drive in a place you haven't been before and you see these mountains of landfills, it, it, it is quite disgusting. Really. Just, I'm, I'm curious here in Ashford, um, we've been to the dairy bar and yeah. I was distressed. I love the dairy bar. It's, it's a, yeah. my summer place. I love to go there. Um, but if I get an entree, it doesn't matter what it is. It's in styrofoam, and not only is it in styrofoam, but it's in styrofoam in a bag, and I'm eating yeah. it there. Right. I'm eating it at the picnic table. Even a hot dog comes in a big styrofoam, two, you know, but yeah, right. container. And, and so I can't. I don't. I don't think a it can. Little paper have sleeve would work fine. Anything. The paper sleeves inside with, the styrofoam. Um. <laughs> no, with, when I was a kid, I worked at a at a dairy sorry. bar. <laughs> Stop. I don't think it has anything to do with with food service regulation because they can serve you, you know, your soft serve in a cone and hand it to you in a napkin. So if that's OK, why can't they hand me my entree in a paper thing or, or in a napkin? I'm totally OK with that. I carry it over to the picnic table and sit down and I don't know what they do at the um, wooden spoon for take out. I haven't taken well, out anything there lately. What I do know is a friend of mine went into the wooden spoon and said, stop giving me all this garbage. This is what I want. And they said, what do you want? And they did it for him. Um, they didn't create all that plastic or, or um, styrofoam or whatever. So I would suggest to you, when you go to the dairy bar, just say, give, my, give, give me my whatever, my entree in a, a paper napkin or a paper bag, you know? And I think yeah. if people started doing that, they might rethink the way they're operating. Because I think you're 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 absolutely right, Stephanie. I don't think it's a it's a rule because you know they can 
in, in restaurants inside, they're doing things like that. And this place, they're handing you the cone, you know, so it's not really health things in the bottom of that. It's just the way it's, we've been accustomed to operating. And we have to really rethink that. And when we ask people, no, I don't want it this way. Oftentimes. It's, it's also a function of how cheap styrofoam is, unfortunately, to, to produce. We're already getting a napkin in addition. So if you yeah. just give me the napkin, then they're not paying for the cheap styrofoam. So right. it, it's got to right. be a cost saver. Yeah, you would think. Well, well you know, most of the time, if I ask for for whatever I want, they'll give it to me. So yeah. you might want to try that. And you know, anybody that's with you goes, oh wow, she got without the styrofoam. Oh, that, that's kind of nice. I keep wanting to try bringing my own container and ask, asking if they'd fill it. <laughs> I don't know if they'd do that or not, but. I'm not sure that's, that's a, that probably is against the health code, yeah. I would think. Yeah, I think that I'm probably pretty, pretty is. Sure. Yeah, but you know, the, the thing about the farmer's market, so, you know, I don't believe that the health code thing is necessarily why they have so much plastics because, especially that new bakery place so they have every single cupcake is wrapped is in a little plastic container every single one and everything everything they have is wrapped in plastic and there, okay I, I, got, I got a loaf of uh i got a loaf and it was in this huge plastic bag that was all folded and wrapped right. under it yeah 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 and that's not at all necessary. There's a, a bakery at the store's farmer's market. She has a, a glass case with all her stuff in there. She takes a piece of a loaf of bread and puts it in a, plastic, a paper bag and gives it to you. You know, she takes a um, piece of coffee cake, puts it in a plastic uh, paper bag and gives it to you. There's no plastic involved, you know. So she has a case to show it off and to keep it from flies and whatever whatever but she's not using plastic so you don't have to have everything individually wrapped in plastic at a farmer's market <laughs> so you know now i don't know what to do about the food you know the the place with the homemade dinners except that whole foods has been using paper containers for probably a decade now so they are available Well, but I, guess, I think you know, if people ask or people mention, you know, I love your food, but I just can't buy any more plastic anymore. You know, can you maybe if you when you put it in paper all or cardboard, I'll consider again, you know, be nicer than me, but maybe say something. <laughs> it might be something that you, you could work on as an equity piece for sustainable Connecticut. But. But the other thing too is you might put it in the citizen as just a little thing that if if you don't want to contribute to the landfill, ask your server or ask um, the the person from whom you're ordering not to give you the styrofoam container or the whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. Two sentences in the citizen. How about that? Can we do that next but time? It's a generational thing, too, is that a lot of people might think if your cupcake is in a plastic container, it's going to be cleaner. Yeah, right. Cool. No, I think it's it's easy for them. You know, they just pop everything oh, in plastic yeah. and then bring it's it. Easier to pack. They don't get messed up and everything. Yeah. Right. Right. It's easier for transport. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I certainly can put a, a statement in the citizen next time. I think that would be neat. Okay, so uh, anything else? I guess we're probably done then. Um, thank you all for coming and have a good rest of the day and summer is here. <laughs> good night. Thank you. The next paper goods. Thanks, Verena. <laughs> bye bye everybody. Good night. Good night bye. everyone. I can figure out how to sign out.
<laughs> Just say leave at the bottom. Pull your mouse over the leave at the bottom. There's nothing at the bottom of my screen. It should be a red a red dot. Uh, I got it. 